Hey, have you heard about the FTC's updating of the standards for safeguarding customer information last year? Your business might actually be affected by this. And December 9th of 2022 is actually a very important date for you. So let's talk about it. So the FCC handles the standards for safeguarding customer information rule, and it's part of the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, or GLBA. It used to only affect certain financial institutions, but now they radically expanded that. And it's based on the activities that you do in your business and not necessarily how you define your business. Uh, a good example is tax preparers. They fall under this. Financial advisors, financial companies, mortgage lenders, automobile dealerships all have to fall under this act. And there were parts of the act that went into effect on January 10th of this year, and I'm not going to cover those. What we're specifically going to talk about today is Section 314.4, which goes into effect on December 9th of 2022. And if you're not doing this, you'd be violating the rule, and that could be a big deal for people. I'll actually put a link to the FTC safeguards rule in the description, or it'll be down below. But the safeguards rule is going to cover financial institutions and it requires them to develop, implement, and maintain an information security program. Now, a lot of companies don't do this today, and it also requires you to cover the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards that are you're using to, to protect customer information. And the rule defines customer information as any record that contains non-public personal information about the customer of that financial institution. And it doesn't matter if it's in paper format, electric format, or some other format, or that it's handled by you or an affiliate if you give them access. So it's important to understand that if your business follows this, that you don't violate this. And it goes on to talk about how your information security program has to be written. It's not just something you talk about, it has to be written, and it has to be the appropriate size and complexity of your business. It has to cover the natures and the scope of your activities and the sensitivity of information at issue. So it's important that you understand that part. And now we'll go into breaking down what 314 really means and kind of just go, go give you guidelines behind that. So what does a reasonable information security program look like? Well, in section 314.4 of the safeguards rule, it actually identifies nine elements that you can use to construct your information security program. So let's take a look at each one of these elements step by step. So the first element is to actually designate a qualified individual to implement and supervise your information security program. Now, this could be an individual that's an employee. It could be an affiliate. It could be a service provider as well. Doesn't really require a specific title. It just requires somebody that has real world know-how. Now, the important thing to understand here is like, let's say you choose a service provider to implement and supervise your program. The buck still stops with you. It's the company's responsibility to designate a senior employee to supervise that person or that service provider. So if the qualified individual works for an affiliate or service provider, the affiliate or the service provider also must maintain an information security program that protects your business as well. So the second element of the safeguards rules to actually conduct a risk assessment. So you, you really can't form, formulate a good information security program without understanding what information you have and where it's stored and how it's used. So after you conduct that risk assessment, it does have to be written. You have to look at all the threats and the risks to the information, both internal and external. You then have to also go back and, and periodically look at the risk assessment and actually update it. So as your business changes and morphs, you have to make sure that you follow through on that. All right, so now that you've conducted your risk assessment, now the third thing you need to do is you have to design and implement safeguards to control the risk that you identified through that assessment. Now there are eight things that they require inside of this, eight controls that you have to talk about. One of them is multi-factor authentication. One of them is actually encryption. And I might make a separate video just on that. Maybe I'll do that for next week. But to keep this video somewhat palatable, that's where I'm going to leave that. Just know that there are eight things that are required. You can add more. It's just that that's the minimum requirement. All right. So you conducted your risk assessment. You put your controls to safeguard your information. Now guess what you get to do? You have to regularly monitor and test the effectiveness of all those safeguards. That means you have to do an annual penetration test. 
That means you have to do vulnerability assessments. And at a very minimum, every six months, you have to test for publicly known security vulnerabilities. And you then have to test whenever there are material changes to your operations or your business arrangements. And whenever there are circumstances that you know or have reason to know have a material impact on the information security program. So if, say you get a business email compromise, guess what? You now have to go back and test all those effective controls. All right, up next is you have to train your staff. Your information security program is only as effective as the least vigilant staff member. So it's important that you put people through security awareness training and identify when maybe there's a weakness that you have to address. So that's going to be the probably the most important aspect after you've implemented it is to make sure that everybody understands what the information security program is and then test them against it. All right, the sixth one is pretty interesting. It's monitor your service providers. And this is important because like HR, payroll, if you suffer as a service to actually do your taxes, it's important that they have security protocols built in to help you safeguard the data that you're using. So you want to make sure that your contract has all that spe spelled out, but you also want to make sure that you're reevaluating those service providers constantly and understanding that if they're not doing things right, then you may need to choose a different service provider. So number seven is you got to keep your information security program current. The only constant that we have in life is change. So if you have any change in your operation, change of personnel, change of something that you find during a risk assessment, you need to make sure that you're updating your InfoSec program. The best programs are the ones that are flexible enough to accommodate those periodic modifications. You don't want something that's a static document because in InfoSec, static doesn't work. We're in a constant flux of change. We have to make sure that we update those programs accordingly. Number eight is you need an incident response plan. You have to create a written one. And this is really just the what if a security event happens in your business. So what do you do? Who do you contact? Things like that. This is a required part of this plan. And you're going to want to make sure that you review it constantly and you're actually making changes to it. And it also means after an event that there's a postmortem that happens. You review if the incident response plan was good and what changes to make to it. So number nine is you're required to have your qualified individual report to your board of directors or governing body at least annually and it has to be in writing. Now, this is important because it's also going to include the overall assessment of your company's compliance with its information security program. So, for example, it's going to include stuff about the risk assessment, risk management and control decisions, service provider agreements, um, test results, security events and how management responded, and also recommendations for changes to the information security program. I know that was a lot. There's a lot more we could get into. It's probably a long webinar uh, or some sort of consulting engagement. But the reality is, is like, this is really a good thing. It's about protecting customers information. It's about protecting personally identifiable information. This is important stuff. The fact that they ex expanded this so dramatically is a really good thing. However, there are downsides. One of them being cost. It's going to be expensive for a lot of companies, especially smaller ones to implement this. This is not a cheap solution. You are going to have to have a written information security program. You have to test it, which can be expensive. You're going to have to review it all the time. You have to make sure that you're on top of this things with employees. If you have an, a security incident, now you have to go back and you may have to change some things in it. You have to modify it. It's going to take a time commitment on your part. That's why I think if you're going to outsource it to a service provider, you need to have somebody in management somebody at really the upper levels of management be involved and be the person inside the company that oversees it. You don't have to have the knowledge to implement it, but you have to at least oversee it with the service provider and be in those conversations. And I think that's important. So I hope you learned a lot from this. If you have any questions, reach out. Um, I'll drop some links down below just so you have it. And like, subscribe, share. If you know somebody that needs some help, let us know. And, but until next time, Stay cyber safe.